Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Red Game Tidicom video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with the specifications of the high end ninth generation SKUs from Intel, which, of course, are based on the Coffee Lake architecture, and these include the i9-9900K. This processor is very impressive, and the link specifications come from the website Kulala. Now, if you're wondering what type of reputation this website has for leaks, because after all, we want to know how genuine or likely genuine they are, well, in the past, they have had a pretty good reputation of putting out information before it is publicly available. So this leak has a reasonable chance of being pretty genuine. So what about the specifications then? Well, we're going to start things out with the top dog, which is the i9-9900K. So it does look like that's going to be the name for this particular processor. And it's very impressive, actually, in my opinion, anyway, for the uh, level of performance and clock speeds we're going to be seeing. The 8-core, 16-thread CPU runs at a base clock of 3.6 gigahertz, and with a single processor core can run up to 5 gigahertz. Total cache on the processor is 16 megabytes, and we're looking at, once again, 5 gigahertz for a single core or two cores, all the way down to 4.7 gigahertz for eight cores in terms of turbo. That is bloody impressive. Of course, the rumors are persistent that these processors are soldered, which would make sense. I mean, I can imagine that these processors will put out an awful lot of heat. But let's assume that you can crank these up to 5.2 to 5.5 gigahertz uh, with overclocking in mind with a fairly reasonable AIO. Obviously, if you've got a high-end water cooling loop, you might be able to go 5.6 or 5.7 or what have you. That, for all uh, eight process all eight processors running at that speed would be absolutely amazing. And I'm going to be very curious to see what the benchmarks for these are going to be, assuming once again that there's going to be no IPC gains across the board. So moving on to the i7-9700K, and this one is a bit strange in terms of the specification. So it does indeed still have eight cores, but lacks hyper-threading, which is completely different to other processors like, let's say, the 8700K. It does make me wonder whether there's a typo there or something like that. Quickly going through the specifications, we've got eight cores, eight threads, um, 3.6 gigahertz for the base clock, 4.9 gigahertz for a single core, 12 megabytes of level free cache compared to the 16 megabytes of the 9900K for level free cache. And then of course, clock speeds diminish depending on the number of active cores, all the way down to just 4.6 gigahertz. And then finally, we've got the i5-9600K, six cores, six threads, uh, 3.7 gigahertz for the base clock, 4.6 gigahertz for the uh, turbo clock, and then nine megabytes of level three cache. So uh, that's quite the cut, but obviously you've only got six processor cores, so it makes sense given the architecture. And then with all six processors running, we're looking at 4.3 gigahertz. The rest of the specifications remain consistent to what you would expect with the Coffee Lake architecture. It supports dual channel memory, 256 kilobytes of level two cache per core. So obviously, let's say uh, the uh, 9900K has the 16 megabytes of level three cache, which will be shared between all of the processor cores, but then you've got the 256 kilobytes of level two cache, which would be per core. Hopefully that makes all sense. So these processors are quite a big departure from Coffee Lake. So for example, the 8700K, it would have six cores, 12 threads, thanks to hyper-threading. So for some reason, Intel are disabling hyper-threading for the i7, uh, the 9700K here. That doesn't necessarily mean bad things. The 9700K could still be an excellent CPU for gaming. In one of our recent videos, we actually tested the impact of increased core counts and the importance of those compared to resolution and GPU performance. And you can definitely see that, yes, larger number of processor cores do, of course, uh, create a smoother performance, but only up to a point. We also found that hyper-threading in some games was not necessarily a large performance boost. In fact, in some games, it actually kind of brought down the performance level a little bit. For example, Gears of War. So it's possible that these processors would be still a really good bargain for gamers, but Ultimately, we're going to have to wait and see what actually happens here. I think for most part, the 9900K is going to be a really solid chip, but really it comes down to the pricing, of course. We're hearing the price points could be like 450 to 500 US dollars, which is rather expensive. 
and is of course considerably more expensive than let's say the 2700X. So there's a couple of questions we're left with. First one, are those prices and of course specifications accurate? The second is, what will AMD do to counter assuming these specifications and prices are accurate? Will they further diminish the price of let's say the 2700 and the 2600 and so on? Or will they also release another SKU? There are rumors, well, by rumors, AMD themselves have all but confirmed that they're considering releasing the 2800X. It's very unlikely that they're gonna increase the core count or cache or anything like that. So it's most likely gonna be purely clock speed based, but it is at least possible that they could crank out an extra two, three, 400 megahertz on those processors. And then obviously charge a premium for that how much of a premium? Well, let's say they charge $50 extra. And then of course, you've got the rather nice price point of the AMD motherboards. I will say that the B450s, which we're actually going to be reviewing one soon, we're actually waiting for the uh, products to be coming through. I can't give any more information about that. But we are uh, going to be reviewing the B450. And I will say that the B450s um, do have a really nice value proposition there because obviously they've got so many of the features of the X uh, of the X400 series. So definitely, uh, if you start factoring in motherboard costs and whatever from AMD versus Intel, AMD can still compete rather nicely with the price performance ratio of Intel, particularly when you consider that the B450 motherboards, for example, overclock very well. Uh, and then you factor that price saving in with the lower cost of the processors as well. It's going to be very interesting in the marketplace. The next generation of NVIDIA cards is going to be an interesting one because there has been another spanner in the works for what we're going to be expecting of the architecture. And this comes to us from HW Info. Both the 32 and the 64 bit executables have, of course, a changelog, which routinely is updated to tell us what the support is going to be, what bug fixes are going to be, and so on and so forth. Changes in HW Info 32 and 64 5.86 go through a whole slew of different changes including improvements for the support of Intel Ice Lake. But here's the really interesting one. There's also upcoming changes in the next release, and there are improvements for the NXZT Kraken X52 and 64 support, as it's been improved in some systems and other bits and pieces as well. But here it is. NVIDIA GV102 and GV104 support is going to be added. So GV, of course, stands for NVIDIA Volta. And what is rather interesting here is that we've been operating under the assumption that Volta will not be the architecture of choice for the GeForce lineup, and instead that will be Turing. So what's going on here? Well, there are multiple different options. The first is that GV102 and GV104 are just going to be like high performance cards, for example, the Quadro series and that type of thing, or maybe different GPUs for the data center. And this is not the first time, by the way, we've actually heard of these GPUs. There were a slew of rumors, if you do a Google, back in like 2017, there were rumors that these things are going to be released. And of course, it would see a cut down number of CUDA cores from like, you know, Perhaps we're going to see like 4,000-ish CUDA cores or 3,000-ish CUDA cores, depending how NVIDIA wanted to segment their product lineup and release different numbers of SKUs. So that did make an awful lot of sense. But we have been operating under the assumption, once again, that Turing would be the GPU of choice for GeForce. So are we going to be seeing a case where, no, that's actually not going to be happening? Are we instead going to be seeing Volta for the desktop and this whole Turing thing has just been, well, for lack of a better word, a red herring. Another possibility is that Turing and Volta are just very similar architecturally to one another, but perhaps just with a few minor differences, perhaps in the core count. So perhaps the GV102 and GV104 are essentially the code names of Turing. I mean, that's a possibility, but my gut feeling is that what we're looking at one of two possibilities. The first possibility is GV102 and 104 are just there for the data center or for Quadro cards. The second possibility is that this has just been added for future support, right? That there is that certainly a possibility. After all, the existence of this in the database does not mean that it's coming out tomorrow, and it does not mean that the card ever does officially get a release. Until NVIDIA actually announces the GPU, well, we can only guess. There are a couple of theories. 
The first theory is that it's going to be a cut down version of Volta. Another theory that people have is it's going to be a Pascal again, but with a refresh. How would that work? Well, it would be based upon, let's say, the 12NM node, the same node that they're using at the moment to produce Volta. That obviously means that they can possibly increase the number of CUDA cores, they can ramp up the clock speeds and do whatever else they need to, including, of course, using GDDR6 for additional memory bandwidth. So all of those factors come together would mean that the GPU would put out an awful lot of extra performance. Ultimately, the only people who really know this outside of NVIDIA probably are the AIB partners. They've probably got a pretty good indication by now of what type of performance these GPUs are going to be putting out. Well, we've discussed NVIDIA, we've discussed Intel, we might as well bring up AMD, right? Specifically the specifications of the 2500X. How reliable are these specifications? Well, pretty darn reliable because Acer themselves have leaked them by accident. Oops. So we have the Acer Nitro N5100 and we actually have the specifications of the Ryzen 5. It is exactly what you would expect for the Ryzen 5 2500X CPU. We are looking at four cores, eight threads, so of course that means uh, SMT there. And we're looking at the base clock of 3.6 gigahertz and does turbo all the way up to four gigahertz and runs at a TDP of 65 watts. Pricing has still not been confirmed yet, but do remember that the 2600 is 199 US dollars so it can't be you know any more expensive than like 200 bucks honestly i wouldn't be surprised if we're looking at around the 150 ish price point at the absolute most that pricing is almost identical to what we saw uh, them introduce the 1500x with but it is possible amd could opt to launch these processes slightly cheaper if only for the fact that they are now competing against of course coffee lake and most likely the ninth generation of intel processors in the not too distant future and now we're going to move over to the Xbox Scarlet. And there has been a slew of new information and leaks concerning the next generation of devices. In fact, Microsoft are working on three distinctive products from the rumors that have emerged on the website forret.com. We're gonna be putting out a lot of next generation console coverage on the channel over the next coming months. But I think that this piece of news does actually really nicely summarize what Microsoft's plans are for the future. Let's start them out. So first of all, we have the cloud. That's right, Microsoft are pushing the Xbox cloud. And this cloud is going to be known as Scarlet Cloud and will do pretty much what you'd expect. It will allow you to play games and stream them from the internet. And there are also a couple of consoles as well. Microsoft are gonna be building the Xbox Scarlet to be a classic console and will be essentially what you would expect it would be the continuation of the xbox SKUs. it would be more powerful than let's say the xbox x uh, xbox one x and of course will maintain backwards compatibility and all of the other good stuff that you would expect according to this report there will also be a second console now the second console does make sense phil spencer did hint and not even hint he literally said xboxes they were working on multiple xboxes a couple of times now you might recall since E3, Phil Spencer did mention that there would be multiple Xboxes. Well, this seems to be bearing fruit because Forrett does mention that there is a second Xbox device. And this device will sit between the current generation of Xboxes and the Scarlet. And it will also make use, heavy use, of the Scarlet Cloud, which I really wonder if that's going to be the final name for the system. Uh, or, the, or the services themselves. Now, there isn't a specific data regarding the performance of this. So I do wonder, for example, how it's gonna compare, let's say, to the Xbox One X. I mean, there's a couple of possibilities that go through in my mind. It could be uh, essentially a cost-reduced version of the Xbox One X. So, for example, we could be looking at a console that's, let's say, half the price of the X, puts out roughly the same level of performance. I say roughly because maybe it's a little faster here or there, and perhaps a few other improvements like a smaller form factor and so on and so on. But that console will act uh, to once again stream games. Another possibility is that it won't be as powerful as Xbox One X. Instead, it will be more in line with say the original Xbox One or perhaps the Xbox One S, but will be a streaming slash portable device, much like, let's say, the Nintendo Switch. Another possibility is that it will be more powerful than the Xbox One X, let's say 1.2 1, 1. times or 1.3 times faster, but the next generation Xbox will be considerably more powerful. Perhaps we're looking at, let's say, 10 or 12 T-flops. 
This report is also telling us that the Xbox Scarlet uh, consoles are not as far along in development as the actual cloud services, which bears a couple of questions in mind. Are they just going to launch the cloud service first and then the next generation of systems after that? From what we're hearing, the cloud services started work back in 2013, but then Microsoft didn't really do much. Even when the original Xbox One was not launched back in 2013, we heard much about the power of the cloud. And from these reports, yes, the Scarlet Cloud was being envisioned back then. Of course, it didn't really come to much, but Microsoft do have the cloud technology. After all, Azure, which is the backbone of Microsoft's cloud ecosystem, essentially is running Xbox Live, right? I mean, if, whether you're doing things such as communicating with friends or whether you're downloading game demos or game updates or whatever, all of that is utilizing their services. So they do have the resources, they do have the manpower, they do have the expertise to really launch an impressive game service and game streaming service. I can imagine that traditionalists will definitely want a physical console. They will want to buy the high-end uh, Scarlet system. And I frankly will be that person. I frankly am someone who really likes the physical system. I, I just like that. I don't really like cloud gaming that much yet. There are reasons behind that, but ultimately I like a physical version of the game. I like to be able to play it locally so that if my internet goes out and all of that stuff. But Microsoft do have an awfully good shot at the next generation if they can get all of this stuff together. My only concern is that they're going to offer so many different products, it could possibly put people off. It could almost be confusing to customers. So I think they're going to have to be just doubly sure that rather than going for, rather than uh, customers being really happy about the choice, instead of the customers feel that, you know, they're not really sure what to do and they feel almost like Microsoft's gone the scattergun approach. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.